epidemiologists and others that w once you get a cluster in a country or in a city, the probability of having a spike um, and having more diagnosed cases goes up substantially. And so the, the, w what I concluded is the probability of a material deterioration in the outlook for the U.S. economy had increased. Um, I'm a believer that it's still uncertain what the magnitude of that will be. It's uh, uncertain what the duration will be. But I thought the probability of some material deterioration has increased to the point where I felt very confident we should take action at the March meeting, which is now a week and a half from now. This situation is unusual in that uh, it's moving so quickly. What I mean by that, what happens uh, three days from now could change my view on the outlook for this situation now. And I also keep that in mind. And so my own view was, given how rapidly this is unfolding with diagnosed cases and news events, I thought we would be well served uh, in the United States for the Fed to take bold action and do it sooner rather than later. It's, it's not going to affect the path of the virus. It's not going to affect whether people are willing to go out in response to the virus. But what I believe it will affect is if we do have a material slowing, and along with that, we have a tightening in financial conditions some number of weeks or months from now, I think having a looser monetary policy going into it will increase the likelihood that the slowing uh, may be less severe. But in particular, as we come out of it, uh, if we have uh, a more accommodative uh, monetary policy, I think it increases the likelihood that we can come out of it once the virus recedes. It's not going to stop the virus from having its impact. It's not going to stop the, the response, which will have the effect of slowing uh, business activity and consumer activity. But it will have an effect, I think, on financial conditions as we work this work through this. And I think it's not the be-all, end-all, but along with a broad range of other policies in the United States, I think will give us a greater chance to work through this situation. So that's why I was a, an advocate of taking this action. Well, you know, uh, given the steep sell-off in the stock market, you know, people's first reaction was, oh, yeah, well, the Fed's coming in. And in fact, people were talking about this. There were so many notes, and people were traders, ex-traders, you know, are probably going, well, uh, People were calling like crazy. Well-known Wall Street economists, they're going to come in early. They're going to help the stock market, da 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 So I think then, of course, you had the sell-off. Then you had the rally. And today you get another sell-off. Uh, I, I kind of see the stock market like the spoiled child that the Fed's in danger of, of spoiling with too much attention. So let me comment. I'll just give you my lens and how I make these decisions. And I'm saying this as a person. I've spent my entire adult life in the financial markets. And so the, the, the ups and down move, up and down movements of the stock market for me do not, do not and did not in this case cause me to take action on monetary policy. Uh, and in fact, uh, I will say, if, if the market, in, you know, on the day we did this cut, the market sold off. And uh, I will tell you, if the market had traded up that day, it would give me no comfort whatsoever that we made the right decision. And the market selling off that day gives me no concern whatsoever we made the wrong decision. Well, I'm not doing it to address current market conditions or even market conditions over the next few weeks. The reason I'm doing this is to address the impact on the economy that I think will happen if the, viruses, if the virus number of cases spike, we have uh, less business activity, we have containment, which is going to create less business activity, and, there, and then the tightening in financial conditions. I think the judge of the moves the Fed will be able to make two or three months from now, but they're, they're intended to focus on the, the path ahead, not current market conditions or what market conditions are going to be in the next few weeks. And so I will also make one other comment. Uh, I'm careful in this job not to comment on whether I think the market's overvalued, undervalued. I'll leave that to other people. But I will say this. I've been watching for the last 20, 25 years equity value divided by GDP and enterprise value divided by GDP, if you add the debt. And I will just tell you, enterprise value to GDP at the end of January was at a 50-year high. 
okay? Mm. It, it, mm. it was 195% of GDP. At the height of the dot-com boom, it was about 180% of GDP. Mm. My experience in my business career is such that when you see something go off the charts, mm. it usually comes back on the charts. <laughs> and so, uh, I, 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 uh, some correction in the market, even if this virus hadn't happened, was something that wouldn't have surprised me. And even with the correction, we're still in the upper decile of market valuation uh, uh, you know, by historical standards. And so we should expect, and I, I'll just speak for, for we, I expect you're going to see a lot of market volatility over the next number of weeks and months. There'll be up days, there'll be down days. Why is that? Because the range of expectations has widened. Anytime you have this amount of uncertainty and companies are not sure what their own earnings are going to be, and I talk to 30 CEOs a month and I've intensified that, companies just don't know what the, the, they know the supply effect, they don't know what the demand effect will be, and they're struggling to estimate their own EPS. So when you have the range of West estimates widen, what you get in the market is this. And so Fed policy is not going to keep this from happening, and it's not intended to, and it wasn't a part of my thinking. So should people be looking, let, let's say, say the stock market isn't going to drive rate cuts necessarily. I think a lot of Fed people are, are in the same position you are. Uh, but what will and is it going to be the virus count? Is it going to be, you know, what city is it rising in? How bad is it getting? The fact that, you know, no, there won't be what we're supposed to be. How many millions of masks by the end of the week that aren't going to be there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Is that the kind of thing that's going to drive Fed policy? Now, it seems a very different metric from jobs and inflation yeah. and retail sales. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to be looking very much at traditional economic data to make these judgments. We're going to have a jobs report tomorrow. I think it's probably going to be a good jobs report. Is that going to affect my thinking? Not really. What that tells me, though, is that going into this, the U.S. economy has been solid, and we, we were likely going to grow this year at two and a quarter or better percent. And I believe after this virus has run its course, the U.S. economy has the potential to grow at more than 2 percent, and I think I'm hopeful we'll get back to that. What I'm going to be looking at, I'm going to be studying every country in the world and seeing what the path is of the virus, starting with China, um, and trying to learn about how this unfolds and how containment efforts affect it. And then we run, we were running at the Dallas Fed, probably like a lot of other banks, a, a various scenarios on what the likely GDP impact is, depending on how this unfolds. Uh, and then based on that, we'll probably, I'll decide what's the most likely one and what's appropriate monetary policy for the most likely scenario. That's what I've been doing up to now, and that's what I'll continue doing. But new data about the virus will cause me to alter those scenarios and change my probability weighting on which one is most likely. And that's the process that we're going through right now. You know, one thing that kind of surprised me is um, how disappointed investors were, markets were on Tuesday when the G7 came out with this statement saying they'll do what's appropriate. I mean, what in the world can the European Central Bank do? Come on, they can barely lower their key rate. That's not going to make any difference. BOJ already has minus 0.1. Can they lower? Oh, we'll lower it to minus 0.2, although they have said they're going to buy securities and uh, and maybe do some of the things more not, not so monetary policy related. But it seems like there's only two central, big central banks in the world that can do much right now, and it's the Fed and the People's Bank of China. Seems like there's a lot of weight on you to get it right. Well, so, so as Jay Powell has said, uh, there, there's been uh, communication between the U.S. central bank and other central banks, and there's been communication between finance ministers and central bankers. Each one of the central banks in the world has different tools at their disposal. Uh, for example, as you point out, the United States has more rate space than Europe does. But other central banks in the world have other policy tools that we actually don't have. For example, the ECB, as you, I think you referred to, they can buy corporate debt. We don't do that here. And so I think what you'll see is each central bank in the world uh, take action that fits what their available tools are. You saw the Bank of Canada acted already. And I'll think, I think you'll see different actions from different 
central banks around the world based on their own situation and what tools they have at their disposal, which will be somewhat different than ours. Well, what about the argument that you know you're just what you shouldn't be cutting rates now because uh, you know you can't fix a supply shock, you know you can't fix a broken supply chain, uh, you can't get people to go out and shop. You know, people are not going to be interest rate sensitive if right. they're worried about the virus. And furthermore, one point that is kind of a bit offbeat, but I think it's a good one. How do you cure the virus? You cure the virus, you put the patient in the hospital by closing factories. That's what China did. You tell people to stay home. That is necessarily, you slow down the economy. You do it kind of deliberately. You have to. It's like you're sick. Lay down, right? So if you're putting stimulus in and cutting rates now, when it's not going to do any good, aren't you just throwing them away? And again, you're wasting your precious ammo. Yeah, so two things. As I said before, uh, my own view is uh, monetary policy, what we did this week, isn't going to help with any of the things you mentioned. And I don't expect it to. What I expect it to do, though, is as we get through this and we have tightening, which I expect in financial conditions, easing monetary policy can help with that. It's not going to help get people to go out or more shop more, and I don't, I don't expect it to. Uh, the, as to why to act now and why not wait, my own view is this. A lot has been made of the fact, which is true, that the Fed has less policy ammunition than we have historically. When we started this, the Fed funds rate was one and a half to one and three quarters, and now we're at one to one and a quarter. My own strong view is the following. When you have limited ammunition, I think you would be, we are wise to use some of that ammunition sooner rather than later. And I think it increases the likelihood we'll have to use less ammunition to get through this. If, on the other hand, my view is you wait until you see severe weakness, I'm not sure there's any amount of ammunition that could arrest the slowing if you wait to that point. So I feel pretty strongly that it's wise to act sooner, more boldly. Uh, and it increases the likelihood we might have to use less policy ammunition than if we had waited till later. What are you hearing from your vast worldwide <laughs> array of business contacts, as you may know if it's listening to his bio, not just Dallas Fed president, but Goldman Sachs vice chair and uh, Harvard Business School and... What are, what are people saying? So what, here's... There's, there are some companies that uh, have, th this started off, had supply issues as a result of this because they have, so they supply some of their goods from China. Uh, interestingly, not as extensive as supply, uh, supply relationships with Mexico. Uh, there are certain companies that are very significantly, uh, and, and that's been well reported, significantly exposed to China. But in terms of the breadth of companies, it's more typical for me to talk to companies that have more extensive logistics and supply chains with Mexico than, and Canada, by the way, than they do with China. But for those who do, what they've told me is a couple of things. One, they're trying to come to grips with it. Number two, in the fall, for a number of them, because they, they feared we were about to have an escalating trade war with China, they actually took steps then to try to beef up their logistics and supply chains because they were worried we were escalating. And that, it turns out, may serve them well and has bought some of them time. Uh, and, and they'll get later in the spring before they have a supply issue. And ultimately, I think most companies I speak to think the supply issue is ultimately manageable. The part that they're struggling with now and trying to come to grips with is what's the demand. Not the supply effect, but what's the demand effect. And what I mean by that, if we have a slowing in the United States, how's it going to affect their business? Which parts of their business are going to be affected? What mitigating factors are there? What things can they do to help mitigate that demand slowing? And that's what they're trying to come to grips with right now. And I would say, in fairness, they're in the middle of it. And because they don't know what's going to happen, they're preparing, like I talked about, scenarios and trying to have contingency plans on how they're going to work through the scenarios. And that's what they're in the middle of doing right now. How bad off is China's economy? I, I, actually, I couldn't believe how many people were so quick to say when this was all starting, oh, V-shape, V-shape recovery from this virus. It'll go down, then it'll go up. Oh, And obviously, many people were put in the position of having to suddenly know about things they don't know very much about. But I just thought, I don't know. It felt like it could get much worse. <laughs> um, and now, 
you know, that's one of the reasons why the markets are so volatile. One day to the next, you people don't know what to think. This headline's good, that headline's bad. But I'm really curious about China. It's the second largest economy in the world. It, when it slows down, compared to even 10 years ago, five years yeah, ago, it doesn't make a deal. much bigger difference to the world economy. It is. So, so the, when China realized this was a severe issue, they took very bold action, containment action. Uh, maybe even bolder than other countries could take, but they took very bold action to try to uh, uh, get through the spike and try to create a moderating of diagnosed cases. Uh, and as a result of those, it's, it's not the virus that slows GDP, it's the reaction, the, the containment reactions, that's what slows GDP, and they took very decisive action. Um, and so the first quarter in China is going to be uh, very weak. They've done a sub substantial amount of stimulus. They're trying to mitigate it. But they're now turning their attention to the next phase of this, which is, is it too soon, as cases start to go like this, is it too soon to send people back to work, to get back to normal? Because what they don't want to do is have this and then have this again. And so they're wrestling through that right now. That hesitancy may cause this weakness to last longer than it would have otherwise, but that's what they're wrestling through. And they're determined, though, to get back online and do everything they can from a fiscal and monetary point of view to cause this to be like this. The question is, how soon can they do it? And we're going to watch very carefully and learn how they're doing that. Um, and you're right. China today is a very substantial percentage, not only of global GDP, but a very large percentage of global GDP growth. At a time where the world is growing more slowly, China is an increasingly percentage of the total, either bigger, and they, they grow at much higher rates. So you're going to see a real impact on global growth in the first quarter. And the spill, there will be spillovers, and there already are to the rest of the world, and clearly here in the United States. And exhibit A for one of those spillovers is the, is the oil business. You know, the price, global, dem, global demand for oil will be negative growth in the first quarter. That's the first time that's happened since the Great Recession. And you're seeing it reflected in the price of oil. You're seeing it reflected in lowering CapEx, job reductions, you know, a lot of stress in the energy business. And so we'll, we'll feel effects of that uh, in a number of industries. And, uh, and that means when the world grows more slowly, we'll grow more slowly. When recessions uh, usually have or often have not just this gradual little slowdown or a Fed that over tightens, but a shock of some kind. Mm -hmm. Is this the kind of shock that could turn the, the U.S.? Well, I can ask you, how much do you expect it to slow down? But a slowdown into a recession and even more broadly create a, a global recession. So this is the thing in my, in my seat, this is the thing I always worry about, is there will be some shock, maybe unpredictable, that causes this. Then the question is, does it go like this? Or does it go like this? And, um, and uh, this is part of the reason. By itself, the virus and the containment uh, responses, I would have hoped would be a one quarter to maybe a quarter and a fraction impact. But you know there'll be the behavioral aspects. Are, are people hesitant to travel? Are people hesitant to uh, go to events? Will events start to get rescheduled? Uh, and, w and we'll get back to normal. And it's unpredictable how long that will take. And this is exactly why, back to where we started, for me, understanding we're likely, it, we may well go through this, easing financial conditions now isn't going to keep the this from happening, but it may help mitigate and increase the likelihood that we can go through this uh, with greater probability. And that's why the Federal Reserve has taken the action we've taken. What do you think when you see, you know, if you look at Europe and you look how low bond yields have been, right? Uh, it's, you know, nothing to see boons negative or, you know. Um, but when you see it in the U.S., does that, does that seem kind of funny? Like we've got a 10-year note at 0.9 and we've got people talking about negative bond yields, particularly at the short end of the yield curve. It's like... Is it something, again, kind of like, how worried should I be about this? Or is it, oh, well, you know, uh, we just don't have inflation, so there's no, uh, no yield out there? So, uh, you know from talking to me, before the coronavirus hit, 
I was worried before this, and here's why I'm, uh, why I'm worried. And we've had historically low yields in the United States and globally before the virus hit. Why is that? Two big reasons. Uh, the, the U.S. population and most advanced economies population, but certainly the U.S. U.S. population is aging and workforce growth is slowing. GDP growth is made up of growth in the workforce plus growth in productivity. In the 70s, just to give you an example, the average annual rate of U.S. workforce growth was about two and three quarters. It's about 2 percent in the 80s, about one and a half in the 90s, around 1 percent from 2000 to 2010. It's been half of 1 percent in the last 10 years, and we think at the Dallas Fed in the next 10 years it's going to average a quarter of a percent. So that's — and you start with that to grow GDP. Uh, this is where uh, women entering the workforce has been helpful. People working longer in their lives has been helpful. And yes, it's a sensitive subject. Immigration has been very critical. Uh, immigrants and their children have made up over half the workforce growth in the United States over the last 20 years, and we think that percentage will be much more in the next 20. So that's number one. Number two, productivity is not increased enough to offset that slowing. Why is that? With all the technology and technology-enabled disruption, most industries are more productive, but we think at the Dallas Fed uh, it, it, that if you've got a college education, your productivity is likely in your career going to go up. If you've got a high school education or less, which is, one, which is 46 million people, you're finding your job either restructured or eliminated. You'll find another job in the tight market, but your productivity and income may be going like this. So we believe strongly from that at the Dallas Fed we need to improve early childhood literacy, skills training secondary education to allow people to adapt more easily to all this technology and this disruption. And we think we have to dramatically ramp that up. If we don't, average, tech, average productivity growth since 2010 in the U.S. has been around 1 percent. The number just came out, I think, yesterday was one and a quarter. So let's generously take half a 1 percent population growth and one and a quarter percent productivity growth, that's one and three quarters percent GDP growth. That — and the sum, story is similar around the world on aging — that's why rates are low. The no, number one determinant of rates, yes, liquidity globally is affecting it, but prospects for future growth are more sluggish, again, driven, number one, by demographics, and in the U.S., by the lack of investment in human capital to get some of these productivity benefits that could offset the aging. And so before we even get to coronavirus, I was very concerned that the low rates was a symptom, uh, not a positive one, of sluggish growth. Yeah, but OK. We've had slow productivity growth, and we've had aging population for a while. Suddenly, though, yields came down a lot more. And a lot of people, there is this, yeah. this criticism, well, it's because central banks have flooded the world with liquidity. Uh, and when you keep uh, the you know, sort of emergency low level of rates, when you keep buying bonds, yeah. when you keep doing all this, you're prolonging something. And it's actually central banks now a lot that are driving this. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a symptom of something that's out of, out of balance. So, the, the, so then coronavirus comes, to take mm -hmm. your points, and we drop from where we were, something like, say, one and three quarters down to 90 basis points. And, and for the moment, as we sit here today, on whatever it is, March 12th, this is, a, this is a substantial flight to quality, meaning around the world, if you're worried about risk or you own an equity portfolio, a lot of portfolio managers have decided the best counter hedge is to own the Treasury curve. So we'll have to see whether this persists. But to your point, yeah, I think central banks have played a role in terms of increasing liquidity. Uh, and I think that's a factor in these lower rates. But I think the number one factor, in my own judgment, as a person who spent most of his adult life in the markets, is its prospects for future growth have decelerated substantially. Uh, liquidity plays a role, but I think we've got to find ways globally to grow faster. Monetary policy is not going to solve these problems. We need ways to grow the workforce, improve productivity. If we were growing faster, I think you'd see these rates uh, come back more, but we need to make structural reforms to do it. Inflation, a lot of different, I mean, there's different ways to look at it. What could happen with the coronavirus in terms of supply shocks and you don't have inputs into production, so price, you have bottlenecks, prices go up versus the demand side. But when you're mentioning global connections, 
inflation, you've looked at, uh, and, and I think in, in a really good, a very thorough way, a very interesting way, I looked at inflation and technical cha technological changes and other things that drive it lower. Yeah. But it seems that as long as you have a big part of the global workforce working at much lower wages, it's very, that's always going to be transmitted to the U.S. It's very hard to get inflation higher when you have a global economy where a lot of people make a lot of less money and people go to those places to produce stuff. Okay. So, so I would have said uh, uh, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, the fact that globalization and the fact that we could outsource things and so cheaply, that was having a big effect on keeping wages down. Uh, well, here's what's changed. I think roll forward to today, uh, I think a good chunk of the lack of inflationary pressure uh, has to do much more with technology and technology-enabled disruption. Uh, by the way, we talk a lot about wealth and income inequality in the United States. There's one place, uh, if you look more broadly, what's happening to income inequality globally? It's being reduced because a lot of these emerging countries that used mm -hmm. to you know, feast on low labor rates, their labor rates are coming up to where they're closing the gap, to where it's not so attractive anymore to outsource to them. It's not like it was. But what is affecting pricing power and really uh, impacting businesses' ability to price is a disruptive competitor who not only doesn't make a profit, but they may not even make a gross margin. And by the way, think of every, think Airbnb versus hotels, think Uber versus taxis, think Amazon versus, you can go on and on and on the list. It, that is the more predominant reason today uh, that's limiting uh, pricing power for businesses. Uh, this current situation we're in will have some mixed effects, but I think I, I, they'll likely be transitory. But I think these technology enabled uh, disruption forces are intensifying. And the way businesses, by the way, are dealing with it, they're investing more in technology to further reduce their costs and reduce techno replace people with technology. And they're merging more. They need more scale. Uh, think of the car dealer you used to buy a car from. It's hard to be an independent car dealer today. It's now a technology business. You don't buy your car. You don't negotiate anymore with the car salesman. You, you go to a site like True Car, and you go into the dealer. You already know the price. You already know the model. And the salesman used to deal with makes half of what he or she used to. The automotive technician makes double what they used to, by the way. And it's hard to be an independent dealer because they can't afford the investment. These trends are going on in every single industry, and I'm watching this firsthand in the job I have. Yes. So um, Europe broadly, Europe, uh, you know, Germany's economy, I guess they've had some signs of a little bit of recovery from their doldrums, recession, whatever you want to call it. Uh, now they've got some coronavirus problems too. When you look at that part of the world, yeah. how does it look to you? How, what, what is the, what, how shaky or not shaky are their it foundations? It looks challenging. and. Uh, uh, we, we've just come off a year where trade tensions really uh, took the wind out of global growth. Now, trade is important in the United States. Uh, exports are 12 percent of U.S. GDP. They're 47 percent of German GDP. Okay, they're the so, most export-dependent country in the world, aren't yes, they? Yes. And, so when you have, and by the way, the, the aging problem I talked about here, our population is at least going to increase. Theirs is expected to shrink. So. They've got an aging problem much worse than ours, and they're sand in the gears of trade, which really has a significant effect on them. So, and, and Europe is much more dependent on trade than we are, and China has a real effect on them. So the growth prospects for, for Europe are extremely challenging, and that's why they're having debates over there, should Germany do fiscal policy? Monetary policy has gone as far as it can go. They've got negative rates. I don't want to see us do that here. Uh, they need broader economic policy to deal with some of these issues. But it seems pretty significant that Germany is actually talking about stimulus, right? Because they have been so anti anything that had to do with fiscal policy. But you can see why when you look at the, I like to look at structural drivers, and the structural drivers primarily for them are there's sand in the gears to some extent of globalization which directly affects them, and they've got a real workforce growth problem. They have very good productivity. And they've got great skills training. They have apprentice programs that's, that helps. But they've got a number of headwinds um, that are uh, 
causing a lot of challenges. It's not surprising. And when you see in Europe rates are negative, the, it tells you the answer is not monetary policy. I would say as a central banker in the United States, we need broader economic policy away from monetary policy if we're going to grow faster. We need structural reforms. We need targeted fiscal policy. We need infrastructure spending. And I think that's even more true in, uh, in Europe. Well, is, I wonder if that's a, a little ray of hope right now, because, for example, um, Australia, Scott Morrison, their government has just pushed back after any thought. That, and they've got this big surplus, right? Yeah. And I think at the RBA Reserve Bank of Australia, they've been kind of hoping, like, maybe you could pony up with a little bit of help. We don't want to... Because I don't... Phil Lowe, the head of the RBA, is no fan of quantitative easing. He's not somebody who wants to have to do bond buying. But just this week, uh, in fact, uh, I think it's Stephen Kennedy, who's their deputy... Tre something. He's, he's, a, he's one of their treasury guys. They're talking about getting 0.5% of GDP knocked off in the first quarter, continuing in the second quarter, and they're finally talking about doing some stimulus. And I wonder if that will be, like, one of the little positive things that comes out of this, because every central bank in the world wants, wants their government to do fiscal spending. Every government sits back because they know, oh, they'll just, they can cut rates for us, right? But I wonder if this is something that maybe finally pushes them in the right direction. It may be. And, you know, Australia is an example of a country as, as a percentage of GDP. And, uh, commodities is a very big percentage of GDP. I don't need to tell you when global growth slows, uh, as it has, it has a negative effect on commodities and commodity businesses. So it's not surprising. But I think the world needs broader economic policy. We've had it, by the way, for most of our lifetimes. It's really just in the last 10 or 12 years that the primary economic policy around the world has been monetary policy. But it's not supposed to be that way. You need fiscal policy. You need structural reforms. Monetary policy surely has a key role to play. But it probably shouldn't be, going forward, the dominant role we're going to grow more slowly than, than we would otherwise. Well, I'd like to open it up to audience questions. My only request is that you have more of a question than a statement or a speech, uh, you know. Um, and I will not hesitate to cut you off if you do. And also that you try to keep in. You're the first hand. Well, either you're the first one I saw. So you can get up and start asking your question. Uh, but keep them succinct if you can, because I think a lot of people would probably love the opportunity to ask Rob some questions. And if you, questions are too long, you make it harder for everybody. So if the person in the, on that row, yes, right there. And then we'll go here, and then we'll go there. So that man who was right there, stand up, or you've got the mic, whatever. Thank you. My question is, do you think this, the coronavirus combined with the 2020 presidential election will have some sort of economic, will have a big economic impact? If so, how big? Thank you. All right. So I'll, uh, I'll, in this job, as you probably know, I stay away from anything political, which gives me the credibility to do my job. Uh, we don't want to be influenced by political considerations or political events, and I try not to comment on them. I would say this. The coronavirus, um, uh, I'm hopeful, but I don't know. I'm hopeful will turn out to be, when we look back a year from now or a year and a half from now, it will have, in hindsight, turned out to be a transitory event that lasted you know, we'll see for a quarter or a, part, a quarter or two, and we'll get back to growing at potential growth. Uh, but I, and I plan, and a monetary policy will do its part to try to help uh, increase the likelihood that happens. In terms of, of the election, the, the one thing we will do at the central bank, and I did it in 2016, we'll look at whoever the candidates are, we'll look at new proposals that they're making, how those new proposals might affect the economy, we'll analyze it. And I'll be prepared to speak publicly on the impact of various different. In the way you may remember, in '16 there was a lot of talk about a border tax, and we did analysis on it, and we were prepared to comment on it. And I'll be prepared to do that. But that's the extent to which I'll go as, as it relates to those things. This gentleman here on the outside, and then there was somebody over there. Okay. 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 Well, um, President Trump. Um, in very vocal and uncertain terms, indicated publicly where he wants monetary policy to go. And actually, he made uh, very strong comments right before the race changed, right in the evening before the race changed. So uh, it can be complete coincidence. <laughs> and uh, even 
subconsciously the Fed cannot ignore this very strong statements, which are completely unusual and unprecedented from American presidents. Whatever opinion they had or didn't have, we never knew about that. Sure. So can you comment on yes. this situation? So please? I can tell you, um, and I've been now at the Fed for, I was a business person, as you heard, did other, other things, Harvard. Uh, I've been here four and a half years. Uh, what, is, what, what any political official says, elected or appointed, has uh, consciously, I'm a human being, of course, but it had, has, had no, has had no effect on my views on monetary policy. And I can tell you the decision that I uh, made, along with others, on Tuesday, uh, political considerations or political com comments from political officials, elected or appointed, has had, had no impact on our judgment. And from what I can see, in my conversations were extensive with my peers. It had no impact at all. All right. And there was, well, let's take, uh, well, I think you, you, we blue shirt, blue shirt, and then we'll just go boom, boom, boom. Okay. Or we'll work our way that way, that way, that way, that way. Uh, thank you for the very interesting speech. Um, given the already loose, uh, historically loose monetary policy, and that um, uh, the, the, the level of the rates are uh, hardly a binding constraint on the availability and cost of capital. Right. How do you balance the benefits of looser monetary policy with uh, the risks of increasing already high asset prices and uh, excessive uh, corporate debt? Yeah, so I, 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 Kathleen knows I worry a lot about that. Uh, now. Rates are historically low. I'll start with rates are historically low for a reason. They're, they're historically low because, in my judgment, the prospects for future growth are, are more sluggish than any time in my lifetime. So you'd expect the neutral rate, the so-called neutral rate, the rate at which we're neither accommodative or stimulative. Ten years ago, maybe the neutral rate would have been 35 or 4 percent. Today, it's dramatically lower. And so that's a consideration. But I, I've been vocal, and I do continue to worry that if we are accommodative or too accommodative for too long, you, to your point, create excesses and imbalances that make you vulnerable uh, to some kind of shock. Um, uh, and we've got to be mindful of that. So I, I prefer to be very careful about using monetary policy, because it can create these excesses. Um, and some might argue. That, uh, that the excess valuation, I talked about how high market cap to GDP growth was going into this. Some of it, I think, is fair to attribute to monetary policy. So I, th I take that very seriously. And so I, I think I, I go with the attitude monetary policy accommodation is not free, and we ought to be very careful about using it. Um, and then you get into a crisis like this, and my own judgment is it was appropriate to alter the stance of it. But I always have these issues in the, in the back of my mind and try to balance, balance them with what we're doing. OK, let's get someone on this side now. Uh, there's a man here with glasses and um, his hand up. And there's a man on your, uh, there you go, on your right with a microphone. Thank you for coming to Chicago. Um, you had talked about the. Um, in the emerging markets, the income gap is actually decreasing. But in the United States, I understand it is increasing. Although there's some improvement in recent years because of the good, strong job market. Do you think our government is employing all the policies necessary to address the income gap, as well as the problem that you just talked to us today about in terms of decreasing productivity and the challenges? Okay. So let me speak in the, po in the positive about this without getting into the politics. It's my own view. One of the reasons why I was, I've been willing uh, to run monetary policy somewhat hotter, one, we don't have, I don't think inflation is going to run away from us because of technology. And so what we've been doing is pulling more underrepresented groups into the labor force and, and putting some upward pressure on wages, particularly at the low end of the wage curve and for skilled workers. I would like to see, to your point, much more emphasis in this country on improving early childhood literacy 
And what do I mean by that? Going from half-day pre-K in some states to full-day pre-K. The fastest-growing demographic groups are lagging in terms of in terms of literacy. And an un a unacceptably high percentage will start first grade behind, and studies show they'll never catch up. Less productivity. I think we should have a dramatic beefing up, even more than we've had, of skills training. We have a, a, a substantial skills gap in this country. Half of all small businesses can't find skilled workers. They're middle class jobs. Every one of those jobs that goes unfilled, lower income. They're great opportunities, but we're not. We need to beef it up at high schools as well as we're already doing making progress in junior. That has to be dramatically improved. And I would like to see us improve the quality of math, science, and reading in secondary education. I think education would be at the top of my list. Uh, in actions that could be taken that would lift more groups, create more upward mobility, and help raise incomes. And, and I think we need to do dramatically more than what we're doing. This side, OK, and um, OK, you are in the middle with a pink shirt. Hi, you mentioned that you do uh, evaluate political well, ideas when it comes to the election. Um, policy ideas. Policy ideas when it comes to the election. Some idea, just a procedural question, some ideas are more plausible than others, right? We, we're so looking at, you, we're, we're trying to, so we're, here's an example. The, the, and I'll use for 16, the border tax was being seriously discussed, and we thought there was actually a real probability that, and when it gets too probable, or it gets to where you think it might be, uh, you know, highly likely, that it's been, then, then I feel compelled we should be doing analysis on it. I already have my team looking at certain things that I think as we roll forward the next nine months might be more probable. And, and I think, uh, yeah, it's appropriate for us to at least do some analysis of it. Sure, I guess the, the question is what factors do you look at when you, look, when you evaluate the probability of something happening? Just try to use our, our best judgment. You know, honestly, you mean, what do I have in terms of the probability? I may not be, I'm probably lousy at trying to guess the probability of certain things happening, but we ought to be pretty good at trying to at least uh, ballpark assess the economic impact on GDP. So that's what we're trying to do. And we're using our, we're using our best judgment, understanding that I'm not a great handicapper of these things. I'm not sure anybody is. Okay, this gentleman in the front who raised his hand early and often. Yes, sir. Oh, well, you're next then. I didn't mean Jim Stone. That's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I can hear you, and I'll repeat the question if I need to. Okay, you got it. Hi, uh, Jim Stone. Um, your um, uh, excellent analysis uh, of the various economic uh, factors uh, leads us to uh, one uh, and only one in conclusion that uh, this is the best time for the United States to acquire Greenland. Uh, <laughs> would, would, the, would, the, would the Dallas uh, Fed? Would you explain how the Dallas uh, Fed is, is analyzing this? Uh, oh, I, I, we, 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 are, we are not analyzing it. No, you're not. I must disclose we are not analyzing okay, it. Okay, this side of the room, the man back there with his hand up. So um, I had a quick question about um, a couple of things I thought were worrisome in the finance market for commercial real estate. And yeah. I was just wondering your, part, uh, your opinion on two things that I've seen that kind of remind me of 2008. Um, I've seen some debt instruments that are becoming available, like long-term interest-only loans in the multifamily sector. Right. And then also um, a couple of financing based on appraisals that I feel like are above what the market would pay for mixed use and multifamily assets. And like I said, it reminds me a little bit of 2008. And I just want to get your opinion on yeah, what's so, going on in that sector. So I was saying to Kathleen as we were coming up here, we formed uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago at the Dallas Fed, a quote unquote financial advisory group where we have finance leaders from around the country to look at the non-bank financial market and the, the two examples you just gave are probably examples of non-bank financing. And what, what I'm looking for is uh, uh, practices that could be done in size. If to the extent somebody may do some, have some unsound practices, but they're small and they're sporadic, that probably doesn't rise to the level for me to look at them. But if they're starting to get done in size, uh, then we need to take a look at them. And so the, both practices you just talked about, if I thought they were being done in size, 
were was significant in the U.S., I'd want to look at them, and if I felt strongly enough that they were unsound, and I've done this, I will speak publicly about it. And that that we don't have policy arms uh, options at the Fed to deal with it, but I can talk about it. And my experience is when I raise these issues publicly, they tend to attract attention, and maybe other policymakers will look at them. Okay, this man in the front row, also in a blue shirt. I, thank you. You mentioned uh, the importance of education and skill development, yeah. and not enough of it is happening. Yeah. My question is for the people stuck in the middle, not Wall Street, mm. yeah. uh, who are trying to save money and so on, their impact of the interest rate decline is significant, especially if it's a gap between the interest rate and the inflation. Yeah. What can the Fed do? to take care of those 80 percent of the population. Yeah, so, so uh, there's, not a, there's, not a, there's not a speech or a group I meet with where this doesn't come up. My mom used to <laughs> explain this to me. And, and so it tells you the cost. There's a real cost to, to having rates any lower than they, than they need mm -hmm. to be, because it absolutely hurts saver, and, it, and mm -hmm. it caused people to take more risk than they really ought to be taking in their asset allocation. So I am very mindful of it, very sensitive to it. Uh, and so do I, t I take it into account. What I'm struggling with is the neutral rate, and rates generally because of sluggish growth are coming down, but boy, it has a big effect on savers. The other, it has a big effect on pension funds and other assets, uh, state pension funds, for example, that have a certain earnings rate they need to make, and when rates are this low, it causes them to over allocate potentially to risk assets to try and take more risk, which it makes them vulnerable to situations like we're going in right now. So this is a problem. Uh, this is why what I'd love to see happen, broader economic policy that causes to grow faster and raises potential GDP growth uh, so that the, the market determined level of rates will be higher and savers can earn more. But if, if the only game in town is gonna be the Fed, or central banks generally, what we're seeing, it isn't enough. We need broader policies if we're going to grow faster. Okay, another. Okay, and then we'll go back. We'll, 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 work, we'll work back. I haven't had anybody in the back of the room. Say so this gentleman. So, uh, all the data from the past uh, shows what you keep talking about: education, skills, and then the impact of immigrants and immigrants' children. Right. So the two uh, factors on growth. Uh, is Germany one you look up on when you talk about education and uh, investing in skills? Are they the best? And why are we not doing it? So uh, let's talk. There's certain different countries in the world do things better or worse than us. Let's give an example. Germany has got an apprentice program, and so that's a nice way of saying their skill training is, you know, really tremendous. Tremendous skill training. A little less emphasis. Uh, people more self-select, do I go to college or do I go for skill training? These are middle-class jobs. They do that dramatically better than us. I don't know that we'll get, ever can get to where they are, but we ought to move closer to where they are. Uh, Canada has done a nice job. They've got a, a immigration system, so a different topic, immigration. They've got a more skill-based, employer-based immigration system than we do. They go out and interview businesses, find out where the holes are, and then they backward integrate. And you may notice we're not attracting the talent here that we were attracting because it's harder to get a visa, but Canada is taking advantage of it, and you notice their workforce growth is ramping up uh, because they're attracting a lot of the talent that we weren't attracting. So they, they, we think the U.S. immigration system could learn a lot from the Canadian immigration system in terms of restructuring. Canada, the numbers show. They do, they, they, they do show that. So what are other things? Child care is critical. Uh, if, if for, for women to, uh, to enter, for example, the workforce, you need available child care, and that's why policies on that, we've learned, are very important. Transportation. Many people want to enter the workforce mm -hmm. and get retrained, but they can't afford the transportation to get there. So these are all things that I think other countries, we do some things better than other countries, but in those areas, I think we could learn. And we lag, lastly, we lag the world, I'm afraid, in math, science, and reading, we rank 20th out of 36 industrialized nations. Many people say, when did that happen? We've eroded. Uh, some of it has to do with the fastest growing demographic groups. I'm confident we could improve it. 
we spent a lot last time we spent a lot of time in Texas lot uh, talking with the governor the lieutenant governor the speaker of the house to encourage education reform I spent a lot of time on it we just passed five billion dollar bill in Texas to do education reform it heartened me and encouraged me that we can make progress on these things if we identify it okay uh, all right sir you in the middle there with uh, your yeah that's you 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 yes thanks for taking the question uh, so you talked about having a long-term mindset with your decision on the rate cut. So maybe taking a little bit of a longer-term mindset. At least the next few months, right. six, three to six months, yeah. So say the U.S. economy or world economy rebounds from the coronavirus, doesn't sink into a recession, let's hope. Uh, what are you looking for? What's it going to take for you to start raising rates again, kind of building up that store of ammunition? So that's a good, I like that question. That's a good question. And I think we have, I'm hopeful we will get through this without a re we'll have some slowing that I hope in, in hindsight will turn out to be transitory and then we will uh, we ideally with some lag we'll get back to to growing that potential and my own view is if we get to that point I'm going to be assessing monetary policy and if I think it should be adjusted I'm going to be recommending and advocating and making decisions that will push you know making an adjustment to monetary policy to fit that new uh, New outlook happened in uh, after the 1987 stock market crash, right? Greenspan Fed cut a couple of times pretty quick, and then things were okay. Took them back. So, alrighty, this side of the room, and um, okay, uh, one of you two over there, you decide. <laughs> uh, we figured two arms would maybe get a better <laughs> likelihood. Thank you both for the great discussion. Um, Hi, Rob. I'm Rob also. Um, How you doing? So now with rates where they are, 10-year below one, we're starting to see a little bit of chatter about uh, you know, Fed, the, the government issuing new Treasury bonds, uh, refinancing debt, maybe even some more chatter about longer-term bonds, 50-year, 100-year. Um, could you give a little sense of maybe some of the benefits and potential dangers of that? especially in light of maybe getting fiscal policy involved in this so, action, too. So I won't, I won't give advice to, uh, to the Treasury on, on what to do, but obviously it goes without saying. Uh, there, there are a lot of concerning things about low rates, but one of the positive things are we're probably $3 trillion in the U.S., by our estimate, underinvested in infrastructure in the United States. China, by the way, we think is $3 trillion overinvested in infrastructure. And... Uh, and with rates this low, you'd like to think that some of these projects could be financed. And a lot of it, by the way, with private money or public-private partnerships. I would love to see us think that we could take advantage of these low rates to build out some of this infrastructure that we are overdue in building out. And I know from, from public reports and private discussions, but even just public reports, the Treasury is looking at uh, you know, different maturities along the curve and issuance. And I, I'll, I'll leave that to them, but it's obvious when rates are this low, it creates some opportunities to, uh, to lock in lower rates for longer, which could be very valuable. All right. You had your hand up a long time. You look so happy. <laughs> um, he asked about hikes. I was going to ask about that. But in addition to that, when you guys cut 50 basis points this week, the futures market immediately took another 50, implied that we were going to, you guys were going to cut another 50 at the March meeting. Do you care to lean back on, push back against that? And what part of the futures market do you guys look at to kind of guide your policy? So I personally don't, don't, uh, don't overread or overreact to what the futures market is saying. Um, that's, that's me. Uh, I also know that, uh, a futures market could change on a dime. Uh, I think what the futures market is reacting to maybe is not so much the Fed, it's reacting to sort of the prospects for, you know, the outlook, and it's reacting probably to the Treasury curve. Um, but I think we're going to have to make an independent decision, and I've said publicly, I would not, I would encourage people not to presume what the Fed will do in March, uh, and I, I have, I certainly have not presumed what we will do in March. Okay, gentlemen, right there, on the aisle. 
we've traditionally thought of shocks as kind of immediate, sudden, and not that long term. Climate change offers the possibility for a whole set of cascading shocks with economic implications. I'm guessing monetary policy is not where you'd go for that probably, but what are the other tools yeah. that the Fed is thinking about long term? So you, you may know, so I've written, at the Dallas Fed, we've done a lot of work on this, and I've written an essay specifically on it, and I speak about it, and here's why. Texas is actually on the receiving end of a lot of these shocks already. We had Hurricane Harvey, you remember? Probably did about $75 billion of damage to the state. We have threatened uh, infrastructure along the Gulf, uh, petrochemicals, refinery infrastructure. A, a big percentage of the country's strategic assets in that area are along the Gulf. We think billions of dollars need to be spent on improving the Gulf. Uh, floods, drought. Uh, and so w our own view is if you believe the National Climate Assessment, the frequency of these so-called tail events is going to become a lot greater, and we're going to have to start feeding them in to actual economic outcomes. The, the, uh, so the most important thing monetary that I can do, you're right, monetary policy isn't going to address these issues, but one of the things I can do with our research muscle is talk about it, and I try to talk about it almost everywhere I go. I think on the positive side, it's an enormous business opportunity, commercial opportunity, for the United States and for our companies. And I think if we don't deal with it, the costs are going to be escalating. It'll affect migration patterns. It's already affecting industries. It's going to affect uh, costs that we have to bear. Uh, and uh, that's why you see so much focus on it. OK, but you're the last one with your that very that finger waving. Yes, that, that's the last one. <laughs> So my name is Gavin Beale. I own Marketplace Mortgage. And I just want to say thank you very much for what you've done driving down the yield. Um, because today, <laughs> I've been busy all day. I paid off a doctor's um, a mortgage and 50000 of credit card debt, OK? Yeah. And we both know that, that that's going to be a huge uh, multiplier effect into the economy. Yeah. So I think that uh, in this conference, we haven't talked about the power of the consumer. And the yes. American consumer is like a sleeping giant that's about that's to right. be woken up. 70% of the GDP. Absolutely. So I think when you had your curve like that, I sincerely think you're going to be like that, like you were saying. I, I think that down the road, the consumer is going to wake up. You know, we still have regulatory issues in my industry, which... You think they'll recover sooner? I, I do, yeah. Okay, I think I literally am improving I'm the cash flow of the average American consumer and yeah. freeing up hundreds of dollars a month. And gas prices are lower also. Absolutely correct. So I think there's a bit of a panic going on right now in the markets yep. induced by the media. But I think that America forgets how strong it is as a country and the consumer. Yeah. It's okay. absolutely... A strong country, so yep. we have to factor that in. And what's happening in the Treasury is driving down the yield to the lowest mortgage rates in history. So I thank you for that. Your point is it's stimulative and it'll help us. Absolutely do correct. This. You've, you've oh, helped me. Good. That's a good way to end this. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank may, you may, very may, much. May, okay. May I turn that into a question? Is that going to happen? Do you agree we're going to get an even stronger mortgage market, stronger housing market? Still, you know, there's a. Thing. I think it's clear as we it, you go back just a month, six weeks ago. We had a historically strong consumer, historically tight uh, labor market, and the consumer is strong. And if we can, if the pers if the persistence of this is not unduly long, I'm quite hopeful the consumer will come out of this very strong. So yeah, I'm optimistic about the future. Okay. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Rob. This was fun.